The Sloth Investor's Bite-Sized Summary of the Little Book of Market Myths by Ken Fisher. Information Overload. The more you read, view, and discuss about investing, the more information that you will encounter. Knowing what to believe can increasingly become a problem the more information you have access to. Using research and his many years of experience within the domain of investing, Ken Fisher busts through the myths that are commonly spouted by the financial media. This is a book that will help to demystify the investing process, and it's a key reason why it's a recommended read by the Sloth Investor. Summary point one. A stop loss can stop your losses. Are you a sports fan? Do you support a football team, a basketball team, or some other sporting team? If you do, then undoubtedly you would have experienced how terrible it feels when your team loses. Doesn't the feeling of loss always seem to hurt more than the amazing feeling you get when your team wins? Naturally, as a devout football fan, I've experienced the pain of loss on many occasions. It's difficult to forget about those losses. Curiously, it appears far easier to recall the heartbreak than the successes. Quite simply, loss aversion can be defined as the fear of bad things occurring. A mistake that a significant number of investors make is to use stop-loss orders. Let's ponder on those three words for a moment. Stop-loss order. I mean, who doesn't want to stop losses? Doesn't that sound good? Well, it perhaps is until you realize that very often stop-loss orders result in negative consequences for investors. Let's slow down a little, though, and reflect on what exactly a stop-loss order is. A stop-loss order is an order to automatically sell a stock or a fund when it falls below a certain amount. The specific amount is up to the individual investor. It's commonly the case that investors will pick round numbers such as 10, 15, or 20% lower than their purchase price. The underlying rationale behind a stop-loss order is that it is supposed to protect investors from big downside. It sounds appealing, doesn't it? Again, as I mentioned earlier, who doesn't want to stop losses? The problem is that stop-loss orders very often have negative effects on the overall returns of an investor's portfolio. First of all, they result in more transaction fees. In addition, and somewhat ironically, they more often stop gains than they do losses. Market corrections are a common feature of investing, and the use of a stop-loss order during such times is very likely to have negative consequences for the overall return of your portfolio. In the Little Book of Market Myths, Ken Fisher states, Certainly, stop losses appeal to that caveman part of our brains that hates losses more intensely than it likes gains. But falling prey to evolutionary responses hurts much more often than it helps in investing. Who wants to invest like a caveman? Market corrections are common. They happen about once a year. If a stock drops with a broader market, that's not necessarily the stock's fault. The stop loss then doesn't protect you against loss. It just guaranteed you sold at a relative low and paid another transaction fee. You might be sitting in cash from your market, and you're now sold stock, reverse course fast, and zoomed to fresh highs. This is buying high, selling low. Remember that the first bedrock principle of the sloth investor is simplicity. A key aspect of this focus on simplicity is inactivity. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that Mr. Sloth echoes Ken Fisher's sentiments regarding stop-loss orders. Quite simply, an irrationally-minded investor must recognize that a stop-loss order will very often hinder rather than help the overall return of your investment portfolio. Okay, here are some final words from Ken Fisher on stop-loss orders. Stop-losses don't guarantee protection against losses. They do increase the odds you miss out on upside, and they definitely increase transaction costs, perhaps why some brokers have never stopped promoting them. There's no evidence they produce better results, but there's mountains of evidence to the contrary. Better to think of them by the name that describes them better. Stop gains. Stop yourself before using stop losses. Summary point two. Wait until you're sure. Clarity. There, I said it. It's a medium-sized word, but jam-packed full of significance. It's something we humans crave. Clarity about the future, whether it be geopolitical concerns, your future job prospects, or even something as simple as the weather, these are aspects of life that no doubt most of us can relate to. It's no different when it comes to investing. Naturally, investors crave some sense of certainty about the future direction of the stock market. However, as much as we wish we possessed one, the simple truth is that none of us possess a crystal ball. In the little book of market myths, Ken Fisher states, Clarity is one of the most expensive things to purchase in capital markets. That's true whether it's a bull, bear, or any of the innumerable counter-trend rallies within. No one can perfectly time bear market bottoms. 
Sure, you can get lucky, but luck isn't a strategy, it's an accident. As painful as late bear market wild wiggles are in the shorter term, you don't want to miss the start of a new bull market. New bull market returns are super swift and massive, quickly raising almost all late stage downside volatility. Even if you suffer the last 15 to 20% of a bear market, it's still almost certainly small compared to the subsequent initial up leg of the next bull market. So what are you waiting for? Get invested. Summary point three, turmoil trouble stocks. Wars, pandemics, fluctuating oil prices, tensions in the Middle East, terrorist attacks, natural disasters, it seems that not a day goes by without there being some fresh new geopolitical crisis. However, despite the fact that the world can be a pretty scary place, through all the ups and downs of the past 200 years, the stock market has continued its gradual upward trend. Perhaps one of the best examples of this notion of continuing to invest through the good times and the bad, of staying the course, is the story of Grace Groner. When Grace Groner passed away at the age of 100 in 2010, she left $7 million. This money was used to fund the Grace Elizabeth Groner Foundation. This foundation seeks to enrich young people's education and future. The establishment of such an honorable foundation is fantastic. Naturally, though, the source of the foundation's funds may have puzzled some observers at the time. Where did Grace get all of that money? Was it inherited? Did she win the state lottery? No, it was, of course, neither of these two scenarios. Grace simply continued to invest a partial amount of her monthly salary as a secretary, and she then allowed time and the magic of compound interest to work its wonders on her stock portfolio. The remarkable story of Grace Groner teaches us many lessons about what it takes to be a successful investor. Firstly, as an investor, Grace appeared to possess an impregnable mindset, remaining impervious to external geopolitical events and the periodic bouts of volatility that they cause. This is a crucial component to successful investing, the ability to turn off the noise and remain committed to investing at all times, through good times and bad. Let's think about some of the tumultuous times that Grace lived through during her time as an investor. In 1939, World War II began. In 1950, there was the Korean War. In 1963, the world could have ended with the onset of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You can imagine the jitters that these key geopolitical events would have caused in the minds of many investors, and yet Grace Groner stayed true, stayed committed to her investing journey. I use the word journey because that's what investing is. Every journey has highs and lows, and inevitably Grace's shares would have experienced both euphoric highs and depressing lows. It would have been easy for investors to pull out to sell during depressing lows caused by the extreme geopolitical events that occurred during the period from 1930 until 2010. This is the period during which Grace invested. However, Grace demonstrated the attributes of a sloth investor in that she refused to cower to the volatility that is an inevitable feature of the life of an investor. When investing, and particularly when engaging in the form of sloth investing, inactivity trumps activity, and to her credit, Grace Groner seemed to understand this from a young age. Grace Groner's time horizon as an investor and her temperament, her steadfast ability to remain invested at all times, provides a fantastic example of how a seemingly ordinary, average person can become an extraordinary investor. In the little book of market myths, Ken Fisher states, Remember that in the near term, stocks can wildly wiggle but over time their upward sweep represents the potentially infinite upward sweep of profits. As mentioned throughout the book, profit motive is an intensely powerful positive force. It's at the root of capitalism and the reason free, democratic, capitalistic nations thrive and less free nations don't. Profit motive isn't sapped because humanity faces challenges. In fact, challenges and a need for innovation can be motivating factors for those willing to take risks to chase future profits. Capital markets are resilient because humanity is resilient. Those who bet against that have been proven wrong time and again. So there you have it, quite simply. Don't let geopolitical events deter you from investing. Summary point four, news you can use. Switch on the financial news on your television or read the financial media and it won't take long until you're confronted with forecasts of the future movement of the stock market. If you're not careful, a combination of slick media coverage and finance-related jargon could tempt you to begin to take seriously the forecasts that you hear and read about. Let's think back to the first bedrock principle of the sloth investor, simplicity. So, here's some simple advice. Ignore stock market predictions. 
Unfortunately, a close friend made the wrong decision based upon such a forecast in late 2016. My friend had recently read a financial news article about the likely negative effects of a Donald Trump presidency on the stock market. Indeed, shortly after reading the article, my friend contacted me to warn me of the peerless effect that Trump's intended geopolitical decision-making could have on our portfolios. Despite my friend's concerns, in true Slothinvestor fashion, I informed him that he should always remain invested and to ignore the clickbait headlines of the financial media. Unfortunately, my friend did not heed my advice, and shortly after Trump acceded to the presidency, he was true to his word, selling a significant percentage of his portfolio. Was this a good decision? Disappointingly for my friend, it was not. At the end of 2017, with almost a full calendar year of Trump in office, the American stock market had returned over 20%. The lesson for my friend, it's best not to try and predict the future, after all, to any of us possess a crystal ball. Instead of behaving like a sloth investor, for example, do nothing to his portfolio, my friend attempted to use his fictional crystal ball, when the best course of action would have simply been action. Viewer engagement with financial media is triggered by appeals to our most basic emotions. For example, the need to exert some degree of control about the future, and in the case of investing, the desire to obtain knowledge about the future direction of the stock market. Despite this, it will be far better for your mental health if you disregard the soundbite circus of the financial media and its future predictions of the stock market. Instead, conserve your mental bandwidth for other aspects of your life, such as family, friends, your leisure pursuits, and your employment. In the little book of market myths, Ken Fisher states, Bad news sells, just a fact. You know that instinctively. When news outfits cover negative news, that's a business decision, pure and simple, to gain eyeballs. There's nothing wrong with that. If you like reading a newspaper, you want it to be profitable. And being profitable means the media will often lead with what humanity naturally will be most interested in. Summary point five. Stocks are more volatile than ever. So... Want me to let you in on a secret regarding this video? I started working on the script for this video shortly after the New Year period. At that point in the calendar year, at the beginning, it's customary for people to be asked to renew their subscriptions to things such as the gym or perhaps to a piece of online software. This entails an acceptance of a yearly or monthly fee. Well, within the realm of investing, I would argue that a subscription to a long-term belief in the historical returns of the stock market entails an acceptance of volatility. This may perhaps sound corny, but volatility is not a bug, but an inherent feature of the system. Morgan Housel, author of The Psychology of Money, states, Volatility is the price of admission. The prize inside are superior long-term returns. You have to pay the price to get the returns. Many aren't. Similarly, in the little book of market myths, Ken Fisher states, First, volatility is itself volatile. It's normal to go through periods of higher and lower volatility. Second, it's a fallacy to assume higher volatility spells trouble. Okay, that's the Sloth Investor's summary of the little book of market myths by Ken Fisher. Which summary point resonated the most with you? If you have time, please let me know in the comment box below. To keep up to date with the latest content from the Sloth Investor, whether this be my book reviews, my podcast, or other video content, please remember to subscribe to this channel.